Hello and welcome to today's webinar on presenting information to your bank and debt management for the next generation, brought to you by the Central West Local Land Services. We've had a really fantastic response to this second webinar, and it's really pleasing to see people engaging in these topics. For those of you who are looking for some strategies around negotiating with your bank, I'd really strongly urge you to go to the Central West Local Land Services website and take a look at the first webinar. Today's webinar has been brought to you by the Central West Local Land Services Ag Team and it's really exciting to see so much engagement. I'd like to warmly welcome Brad Sewell for, from Robinson and Sewell Partners. Brad, in today's discussion, will take us through how to best present our information to the bank and other financed institutions and ways that we can look at discussing strategies and considerations with dealing with debt management for our businesses as we move and hand it over to the next generation. Before we get into today's webinar, let me do some introductions and run through the nuts and bolts of housekeeping. I have the pleasure of being your facilitator today. And for those of you who I haven't met or engaged with, my name is Wendy Gill. I'm the Mixed Farming, farming Officer based in Forbes. Co-facilitating today in our discussions will be Neralee Brennan, the Team Leader for Ag Services, who is based in Dubbo. If you need any help or assistance, contact either myself or Neralee through text message, or you can give us a call as well and we will help you with any of the background tech that may need to be sorted out. Neralee and I will be both co-chairing with Brad the uh, question and answer session, and we all look forward to that session as we've allowed some little bit of extra time to go through some of your questions, which have been really well um, received in that diversity of that pre-event questions that we, we put forward to you guys in registration time. Righto, so, on the right hand side of all of your pan computer panels today, you should see the control panel. So you can collapse or expand this control panel at any time during the presentation using the orange arrow, as you see on your screen now. Earlier today, all participants were sent by myself an email that contained the webinar handout. And there is also um, three workshops within that webinar handout section. These notes are there for you to write your notes on and also to give you greater context of any of the, today's discussions. If you haven't had a chance to look at that email, don't worry, don't stress. All the handouts are also attached on your control panel today and they are there where you can individually open them for your access and referral. All participants will be also muted today and we will be recording today's event so that you can uh, watch this again or if there's some other people you'd like to refer this webinar to, you can also do that as well. Feel free to write in and submit questions during the webinar. You can do it either through the text box as shown now or you can also use the raise your hand function if you have a really good quality microphone and if your internet and uh, quality internet speed is is there and, and with you today. So we'd really encourage you to engage in those ways and ask the questions that you have as we go. In terms of format for today's webinar, Brad will give his presentation for about 45 to 50 minutes and during the presentation he will be referring to those handouts as I mentioned to assist listeners along the way with the different content and context of the uh, webinar discussion. We'll then move into a question and answer session for about 20 minutes. Um, so we will be addressing some of the questions, as many as we can get in, no, of the pre-event questions that you, you sent through. But also, we will, um, we will also then go through any live questions as well. So uh, that's a perfect time to really engage with Brad. I'd also like to draw the you as participants your, your attention to um, the information being delivered in today's webinar. So today's webinar 
information is being delivered and should be considered in a general context advice only situation. It has not been prepared or or is specifically addressing your individual business or finance needs and objectives. I would strongly encourage you to consider your own personal circumstances and also to seek your own individual personal financial and business advice. So do that by going through your chosen advisor that suits your individual circumstances. I'd now like to introduce our guest presenter, Brad Sewell. Brad brings with him 30 years of professional experience to our discussions today in, across, in and across the rural and business finance sectors. He has had major roles as a specialist rural lender, prominent bank, and provides independent finance advice to primary producers throughout the country. He started Robinson and Sewell Partners in 2010 with his partner, Ian Robinson. The business has worked really hard developing strong relationships with agribusiness owners and operators. And Brad is very well known in the finance industry and has built a superior reputation based on his business models and his attention to rural agricultural business. Brad underpins all his finance experience and banking experience with his lifelong association with working in agriculture across many enterprises, including your beef, sheep, cropping enterprises, both in New South Wales and also Queensland. Amongst that, within a more recent context, Brad keeps himself very well grounded in terms of agricultural interests uh, through his own mixed farming enterprise based in the central west of New South Wales out at Ningen, for those who uh, know Ningen very well. And we're extremely happy to have Brad speak to us again today. So I'd welcome Brad and I'd like to hand over to him now to start his presentation on presenting information to your bank and debt management for the next generation. Thanks very much, Brad. <clears throat> no worries. Thank you, Wendy, for uh, having me once again and um, welcome everybody to today's uh, webinar. So um, uh, a couple of topics, um, one drilling in a little bit more detail on top of what I spoke about uh, a couple of months ago in the last um, local land services webinar and uh, but we're going to actually start with um, <clears throat> um, the subject of debt management for next generation but before we do that we um, might just move forward on a slide Wendy um, just to give you a bit of a, an idea Robinson Sewell Partners to uh, provide debt advisory services to farmers um, and regional and rural small businesses throughout Australia. So we do have clients in Western Australia, Northern Territory. Um, we do have an office in South Australia, uh, quite a large portfolio of clients in Queensland um, and then obviously in New South Wales and Victoria where um, uh, a few of the partners are located. So we've been involved in uh, over $650 million worth of transactions in the last 10 years, um, which um, which has been great, but it's still reasonably insignificant when you look at uh, rural debt, which is at around $70 billion. Um, so the majority of farmers do um, owe money and, um, and finance is one of the biggest costs in agriculture and that, that cost is principally um, what you call interest on the loan. So if you look at your profit and loss statement and you owe money, it's typically in the top three expenses uh, in your business, um, but it's probably the one that um, is uh, dealt with the, le the least. So that's that's where we come into play in representing clients in their negotiations for all sorts of things. And I'll talk a bit of that a bit more later on. Um, so let's dive in and um, next, so we're gonna talk a bit about debt management for the next generation. So this, has a touch of um, succession planning in it. I, I don't do succession planning, but um, being involved in finance, it's it's always part of a, a business's um, uh, long-term future. So I've always said that about 90% of all the clients that I have, uh, have I, are either involved in succession planning right now um, it's it's something that's just over the horizon or it's something that they've just come out of. So I'm going to give you some, I'm not going to tell you how to do succession planning. That's not what this piece is about. It's about um, just giving you some finance perspectives on 
um, getting ready for uh, or, or managing debt for the next generation. Um, the first thing I'm going to say is that you need to keep your bank informed um, of what your future plans are. Don't don't form a succession plan um, with your accountant and your lawyers who are there to you know advise you on the tax implications and the asset protection implications of a succession plan without keeping your bank in the loop as well because quite typically any succession plan requires an adjustment of debt or some new debt so um, <clears throat> you should never leave it till the last minute to all of a sudden spring a uh, a um, a proposal that's maybe have been three to five years in the making between the family and, and bank uh, accountants and lawyers um, spring that on a bank at the end and find out that it was a totally unbankable deal from the start so always bring your, your bank manager not into the meetings in the succession planning meetings but just keep them informed of what's going on um, so off-farm investments are typically a a way of, of if you've got say three or four kids um, in your family and maybe only one or two want to come home and um, uh, a couple want to stay off farm. Off farm investments are typically a way of, of um, getting uh, or preparing for succession planning or for the next generation. Um, it's um, because this is not just about debt management for the, for the, for the, for the people or the, or the, the dependents or the children that are coming into the farm. It's also about debt management for those that aren't coming back so that at the end of the day, everybody feels like um, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a reasonable outcome. So you need to start as soon as possible and, um, uh, and, and but typically pick your timing. So there's no point trying to buy more country, uh, buy off farm assets, uh, you know, in the middle of a drought like we've had for the last three or four years. <clears throat> it's been a very difficult time to, to, to borrow money other than just trying to keep the farm um, operations ticking along. So what I'm seeing at the moment um, and it's a point I'm going to make a bit later on is when things improve like they have in the last few months that is the time to start considering um, how you're going to um, position the business um, to cater to the next generation and the next generation as I keep saying is not just the maybe the, the child or, or children that are coming back to the farm but the ones that aren't as well so um, make sure that uh, when those good years come that you, you remain focused on what that long-term um, outcome is because you, you as you all know you don't get many opportunities um, to have a good run of seasons. Um, they're usually broken up by some pretty bad ones. <clears throat> so obvious examples, share portfolios they're easy to start with. You can start with as little as a thousand dollars and work your work your way up over time. Um, don't lose heart if you haven't started. I mean, I, I this you you you'll heard it a thousand times from financial advisors. The sooner you start an off farm investment, um, the, the bigger it gets further down the track. And um, I've certainly seen some really good examples of families that have got in you know 20 years ago and just keep chip chipping away at a share portfolio and um, and now have a quite a sizable um, portfolio to um, to to work with in the future um, obviously real estate um, buying <clears throat> um, property um, you know apartments in wherever it might be Newcastle Sydney um, the, that's you know and, and it comes down to the larger the scale that I, I typically find the larger the scale of the operation the um, the more firepower you have to maybe sort of invest in places like Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane as opposed to um, you know maybe a regional centre. So Newcastle is <clears throat> quite a popular investment area for people in the Central West now. Um, <clears throat> I've been involved in a number of transactions of buying um, investment properties um, in in places like Newcastle and Wollongong. So <clears throat> yeah, but again, the sooner you start, the better. Um, just be aware that you know when you're managing um, managing debt for the next generation, it's um, uh, home loans are actually harder to get at the moment than farm loans, believe it or not. It's um, um, and then it's exacerbated by the fact that farmers have been in drought for the last three years, and and all banks at the moment, it's it's absolutely black and white. If your income doesn't show that you have the capacity to repay debt. Um, uh, because you haven't been generating any profit, <clears throat> then it is very hard to get to um, to get a home loan, and that's that's been largely brought about by the drought. The Royal Commission, <clears throat> um, 
I mean, it flushed out a whole lot of bad practices that that were in the banking industry, but um, the downside of it is it's created a lot more compliance within the bank, which is by and large good, but it has made it harder to borrow. And now we've got COVID-19, <clears throat> um, which is actually, I've just noticed in the last probably two to three weeks is now starting to have a genuine impact on on, on what where banks are thinking the economy is going. I've got a um, an interesting transaction in Victoria, a property that's not a long way from Melbourne and um, yeah, we're just just some of the feedback I'm getting is that uh, you know the property markets or the banks perceive the property markets going to sort of struggle a bit over the next 12, 18 months or more. So it is hard to get home loans, which means it's hard to sort of in, invest off off farm. Quite often, the the best way to do it is to uh, to maybe try and borrow through the the farm debt facilities that you've got. Um, one of the traps we need to uh, <clears throat> avoid and I see it all that I'm seeing it now um, is you've got this long-term plan of positioning the whole family um, or the next generation uh, whether whether they're coming onto the farm or not your plan is to buy some off-farm investments <clears throat> um, but the the trap I see time and time again when you come off the back of a drought like we are now farmers are passionate about farming and they and I've got some examples at the moment that tend to sort of drop the ball a bit on the long-term plan for the next generation and and want to buy more rural land, um, which doesn't necessarily fit into um, how the next generation is going to be managed. So it's um, you know when when the when the hills are green and the and the crops are firing, it's um, it's easy to sort of just want to keep investing in agriculture because that's that's our passion and that's where we want to be. So just Try and remain focused on what the long-term picture is, and um, and ensure that you know you're catering to um, everybody in that next generation, and and maybe just not the one or two that um, that that want to stay on the land. Um, it's fine to buy more land if that country's been earmarked um, for a split up amongst um, the next generation. And I have been involved in some transactions where pieces of land are earmarked for um, children who ha actually have no interest in agriculture, but that um, that's going to be part of their um, their uh, intergenerational payout. Uh, next slide, please, Wendy. So di distributing <coughs> assets when it's needed. So um, dealing with the next generation early actually increases the probability of the deal being fair rather than equitable. <coughs> and what does this mean? It, basically means that if the hard yards in life are done when we've got young families, kids, um, we all, you know, in agricultural rural communities, we, we, we generally aspire to being able to send our kids away to a, a regional or a city-based um, boarding school. And um, the cost of that, as many of you know, is quite high. Um, we've just got you've got the costs of mortgages, etc. So um, I always believe that um, trying to uh, uh, manage the next generation or the, or the succession planning early um, can mean that you get um, solutions that are far less costly early on than what they are down the track. Um, just as a case study, I have a family <clears throat> in Queensland, in Western Queensland, where the daughter is passionate about coming. Well, she's already back on the property, passionate about agriculture, and the son, who's a graphic designer in Brisbane, has absolutely no interest at all in in the land. Now, the property alone is probably worth about seven million dollars, um, and then we've got livestock and plant and equipment on top. The son's made it very clear, and he's only in his um, early to mid twenties, that he would be happy to relinquish all interest in the farming, in the in the, in in the property, and everything to do with it if all he had was a two or three bedroom apartment in Brisbane um, and, and you know, at a, at a cost of about six or seven hundred thousand dollars. So it's, um, it's, it's, you know, debt management um, for the next generation is, um, is quite often about actually um, taking on debt now uh, because it could save you a hell of a lot of debt further down the track. Because once you get past that hump of school fees, and mortgages for those children that are um, not on the on the land. If they've done all the hard yards, then they're um, 
then sorting out the next generation or the succession plan is far less um, in, in, in important to them compared to helping them out early on and dealing with it early on. You, quite often I see that um, the longer you leave it, the greater the expectation from everybody as to what they should get regardless of whether they need it or not. So yeah, if you can find a solution or, a, or an agreement where um, you're helping everybody achieve goals early in life, then uh, that can work really well. Uh, next slide, please, Wendy. <clears throat> So positioning for a land split. So, um, uh, you know, from a debt perspective, um, everybody in the family knows who's going to get what, for instance. Um, there might be three or four properties um, and someone's going to get property A and someone else will get property B. Um, <clears throat> but right now, a bank, your bank might have security over all the country. Um, and so it's in your interest to um, always keep an eye on on obviously the value of your land and, and the amount of debt you have and if there is an opportunity to release security i have the bank release a mortgage on a piece of land that's going to go to um, um, one of your children or um, in the next generation then you should get that done because the, the sooner the better. Um, banks, once they've got a mortgage on land, they dislike giving it up um, and you don't want to leave it um, you know, to the last minute or the middle of a drought to ask a bank to release security when um, the, one of the next generation actually want to go their own way. So you might have three or four kids that are going to pick up one property each and you get to a point in the family partnership where someone says they want to break away and do their own thing. Uh, maybe things aren't working out um, with the family as a whole and, and, and it would just be better in, in everyone's interest if, if um, one or two split or one was able to do their own thing but you can't leave that um, to the last minute or, or, or where seasonal conditions or commodity prices are poor because a bank will simply not, um, you know, they're reluctant to release security in the best of times um, let alone when things aren't working for you. So. Just keep an eye on, you know, when those opportunities arise. We uh, we quite often involved. I'm just involved in one at the moment where it's quite a complex intergenerational transfer, and um, we've been able to uh, get one of the properties released um, from security, which is just making everything so much easier. And that's on the back of you know just the rain we've had recently. Um, you know the cash flow for this family is looking really good for the next year or two, and the bank's feeling more confident about their position. And when a bank feels confident about your position, they're going to uh, consider those types of things like um, releasing land. Um, uh, it's going to be a lot easier to, to achieve that. Um, next slide, please, Wendy. This was. Um, Sort of, I'm, I'm talking about this. This was a question that came in in the last couple of days, just gearing up for this presentation. <clears throat> Make sure they don't run off with the wealth. So, <clears throat> I've actually seen this happen before, where there's a bit of a succession plan, but ultimately the person that comes back to the land tends to end up with significantly more potential wealth um, than than some of the other siblings, um, and and you know. There's one rule apparently in succession planning. There's a, there's a lot of ways to skin the cat on this topic, but if there's one rule, it's generally that um, you know succession plan just needs to be fair. It doesn't need to be equitable. It, it, it just it, it comes back to this sheep station in Western Queensland versus a, a two-bedroom apartment in Brisbane. Someone can actually see a deal being highly um, highly or very fair if they if they get a two-bedroom apartment worth six or seven hundred thousand in Brisbane and they see that being is ex extremely fair um, in terms of the sister getting the seven million dollar property and and all the stock and plant that go with goes with it um, uh, it's not equitable because it's not we're not splitting it down it's not 50 percent down the middle on the numbers so um, and this has happened I, it happens a bit not not often but someone does inherit a disproportionate um, share of the wealth and um, 
and then thinks, no, agriculture is not for me and I'm going to um, sell everything up and you know, literally go to the Cairns or, or the North Coast and, and, and live the high life and, and, um, and that can, can leave, you know, a reasonably bitter taste in, in other family members, you know, parents, siblings, because the intent for most families is for a, you know, a generation to take on the farm and continue to do that. And that's why um, we do, you get fair rather than equitable um, outcomes in this because it's, it's, there is still that underlying desire within families that the, the family farm continue in the family name. So to protect, um, to protect um, against that, I've seen quite often just a simple agreement that's backed by the capacity of the parents to lodge a caveat on the title of the property in the event that the property was sold um, prior to a, a or within a certain time frame. So, for instance, um, the son in Brisbane might get the unit and the daughter might get the farm, but if she was to turn around and sell the farm within 12 months, then 90% uh, of the proceeds go back to the parents. Um, if she sells it within two years, then 80% of the proceeds are to be paid to the parents and so on and so forth. So if it was sold within five years, then 50%. After 10 years, there's no, there's no, um, <clears throat> there's no condition or caveat and that, that that agreement can be backed by what's called a caveat on property so that if for instance the daughter sold that property within three years um, then the agreement said well 70% of the proceeds need to go back to the parents because the intent of that that transaction was that she would continue on with that property um, for the long term then um, the, the parents can lodge a caveat on title um, and that can actually stop a transaction or a sale going through so yeah, that is one way to um, to protect um, um, you know that 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 overall intergenerational transfer when when and protect everyone's expectations I should say. Um, uh, another question that came through. Next slide, please, Wendy. When do you make them learn? And, and and I took this as being when do you make the next generation learn about debt? Um, and I believe that, and and I see it every day. Um, uh, if it's if it's become quite evident that um, you or one of your children um, are back on the on the farm with a a long term intent of being in agriculture, then you should be involved in the the finance and the debt management um, from day one. It doesn't mean you have to be making the decisions, but you certainly should be observing. Um, I'm working with a family in the central western New South Wales at the moment where um, one of the children is, um, you know, um, got all the skills of running Excel spreadsheets and has been doing a lot of the work around a cash flow, the cash flow forecasting for the farm for a particular transaction we've got to do. Um, that child has been involved in the in in the discussions with bankers and driving around the farm with bankers and and just generally picking up on how banks you know what they say how they communicate where the key points are so um, it's it's important that in debt management uh, that you know you don't hide the next generation from those discussions because if all they if all if by the time they're 30 or 35 and if all they've learned is how to muster and mark uh, sheep and 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 shear and drive a tractor then they're going to be highly deficient from a from a, a business management perspective um, you know the next generation they should be seeing your profit and loss statements and your balance sheets and and um, and I don't see I generally don't see enough of it it's um, you know, it's it's <clears throat> typically um, you know it's the next generation that are that are that are pushing hard for half a million to a million dollars worth of plant equipment purchases simply on the back of the rainfall that we've had earlier this year. You know, we've got to have the latest and greatest, but the you know they need to understand what the impact of that is on debt management. And and one of the biggest impacts on debt at the moment is the way that banks view equipment finance. Um, 
you know, a, a, a three or four hundred thousand dollar tractor is amortised um, over five years, which means it, it has a big impact on cash flow. Um, and when banks sensitise that, i.e., add another two or three percent to the interest rate, um, it, it it can be the difference between you know making or breaking a property transaction. So, yeah, just um, um, just get 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 the next generation involved in those discussions as soon as you can. Uh, next slide, Wendy. Last one. <clears throat> um, look, debt reduction versus reinvesting um, on and off farm. So, look, reducing farm debt is is good, um, but it can actually create a bit of an intergenerational issue later on. In that, say, one of your children. Everybody has a basic understanding of what's going to happen in the future, um, and the sibling or the child that's working on the farm is used to 80 or 90 percent equity in the business. I.e., there's not a lot of debt. Um, when it comes around to um, the split being made and some debt potentially, so a succession plan could be simply just a cash payout to some of the other siblings. But um, if you're the if you're the child that's you know working on the farm, and I have seen it, they 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 very reluctant, um, having been used to a, a, a lower level of debt, to take debt on to pay out siblings. Um, it can work the same with banks. I mean, banks get used to a family being at a sort of particular debt level, and then all of a sudden there's this big call up. For, for debt to um, to move the next generation on, um, and there's nothing in it for the bank really. Um, it's, it's more a personal thing. This in, a, in this succession planning obviously it has some implications for banks, but if we're in the middle of a drought or a commodity price correction, a bank isn't going to um, provide added debt um, to pay someone out because it actually it's not contributing to the production of the farm um, at all by um, uh, by by sort of having cash go out of the system. So I can assure you I've seen plenty of it. I've, I've seen a lot of succession plans put on hold in the last three or four years because families simply don't have the capacity to borrow to deal with it. Um, and that's why you get right back to my first slide, which is the sooner you start dealing with it and, and, and maybe acquiring some assets or, or, or paying some cash out, the easier it will be down the track. If you leave it all to the the last minute, and then you, you you're looking to borrow, one you'll have um, a sibling or a child who's reluctant to want to borrow because they're used to not borrowing any more than what's traditionally been borrowed, and and um, and then you might have a bank that's also reluctant. So so look, they're just succession planning. Um, it's a really hard topic, um, or intergenerational planning is a really hard topic to cover off on. There's a there is a thousand ways to skin this one, and and some of you have agreed with what I've said. It's a some of what what I've said is irrelevant. Um, there's just yeah, but I think if you've picked up one or two things, that's great. Um, I wouldn't expect you to have picked up much more than that because it is a uh, and a highly inexact science, but I've just tried to throw a little bit of a debt perspective um, on that for you. Radio Wendy, now we're going to move into the next um, subject, which is I think probably the one that most people are, are probably interested in, um, which is how to present your information to the bank. Now, if anyone listened to the last webinar, I'm not going to go into too many um, details on a particular couple of slides there. Um, and you'll need your workbook for this. Um, it's called Sample Credit Paper, okay? Um, but and this is all about <clears throat> this is all about knowing that bank managers are stretched. I can't believe at the moment how like it is. Bank managers are just they're really struggling for time. So the reason you need to know that is because there's thousands of farmers out there all trying to present their case to the to their bank managers, either through an annual review or to buy a property or or to do all sorts of things to negotiate for a better deal, better interest rates. Um, and you only what you have to do at the moment, which is what we do, is you have to pitch your information to the to the effect that a bank manager can understand where you're coming from within about 
20 to 30 minutes of their time. Um, they've got a lot on at the moment. They don't have a lot of time to sort of sift through masses of paper to work out exactly what you're talking about. So we're just going to work our way through um, these. So first, next slide, Wendy. Um, and this, the sample you've got in front of you is is pretty much how we do it. I mean, even our most complex, my most complex deals typically don't go past maybe four or five A4 pages because I'm very conscious that bank managers aren't going to give um, the deals um, a lot of time. So the first one is the borrower. So the borrower is never, <coughs> um, if you've got these papers in front of you, the borrower is never just um, Mark and Mary Smith. It's uh, You need to specify, especially if you're going, talking to some potential new banks, full names, um, the name, the trading name of the business and the ABN. Sounds simple, but a lot of people do actually miss it. Um, just by providing the ABN and the, and the company name allows a bank to do a couple of searches in the background. Obviously your address um, and your location from the address. Um, you know, all the time, like you know, I'm doing a, a job in the Northern Territory, well, <clears throat> everything's three to four to 700 kilometres from either Darwin or Catherine, and um, it's always good to know what direction from, um, from, a, from, a, from the nearest regional centre um, you are because bank managers will typically sort of get a picture pretty quickly of okay the 35 kilometers northeast of Dubbo they'll get a, they'll have a pretty good picture of what the type of country is and um, etc. Uh, the name of your accountant, um, your business type and I kid you not it doesn't have to be any more detailed than dry land sheep and winter cropping um, or should be probably dryland cropping and, and, and sheep and wool production, but uh, you don't have to go into war and peace on, on, on the business type there. And just who your current bank is, and it's always good to, to list who your current bank manager is, because all the bank managers, you know, in, in, in throughout Australia uh, on a regional basis know each other, okay? So um, if you are putting, say you, you, th you think your interest rates are a bit too high um, and you just want to sort of get a bit of a feel for what's going on in the market, um, it's good for the other alternative or potential alternative banks to know who your bank manager is um, and they'll get a gauge of, and then they'll know exactly what type of relationship you're having with your bank. Um, brief description, again, I haven't, I'm not shortening this stuff. Um, it's, um, you know, we don't, write a lot this so it's more about just giving a bit of background own and operate sheep wool and dry and cropping property um, 50 kilometers northeast of Dubbo that doesn't quite match with what I wrote above but um, 1500 acres of level to undulating red loam soil 85 percent arable banks always want to know how much arable country you've got and um, uh, which is the arable countries used for crop and pasture rotations um, Mary works off farm as a nurse. Marks runs the farm and does casual labour. Um, the neighbouring property is for sale for one million dollars, and this property would fit well into the current long-term goals. So, I mean, you can probably throw another paragraph or two in there, but again, don't you don't need to sort of um, expand too much on that. Um, the next one's historical income. So this is where we start getting into saving the bank manager time. So um, all you need to do is jump into your profit and loss statement in your financials and um, extract um, things like the sheep sales that, you know, how many sheep, or sorry, what was the value of sheep sold in 2018, 17 and 2016, um, your wool check, your wheat, um, Mary's wages and Mark's off farm wages. If you can just summarise that in the table, you've actually just saved the bank manager trawling through three years of financials. Um, that would typically take maybe 15 minutes um, of their time. Um, again, you, you're not only competing for the bank manager's time, you're competing against a whole lot of other files that are trying to jostle for a response and, 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 a, and a positive um, interpretation of your business. So historical income is important. You can actually take it one step further. Um, you can um, create another table that basically says how many sheep you did sell and then um, you, you can actually divide the total number of sheep sales by the number of head and it'll give you the average price that you received for your sheep. And if you start doing that over three or four or five years, it actually 
you know, just create some good solid um, information for banks to look at. Banks love historical data. They look for trends. They they just they just they just like to see a string of, of, of historical information that, that from which they can sort of then determine where you are now and where you're heading in the future. Um, it's very important that you state what your current bank loans are um, and 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 what loans you want. Um, so don't present a whole lot of information, cash flow forecasts and, and assets and liabilities and tax returns without actually saying, well, this is what we've got, this is the debt we've got, and this is actually what we want from the bank. So um, that's it's not hard to do. <clears throat> I mean, all of this looks really simple, I know, um, but you know, it's it's typically people um, without really knowing what to give a bank can sometimes give a bank too much or or too little. And um, and and if you can squeeze it in all. All on. I'm st because of the, the. This is. I'm not sure how many of these talks I've given, but um, I am. A, a few people have been coming back to me and saying, "What well, does this credit paper look good?" And they're typically around two to three pages. Which um, I had looked at one this morning for a young couple up at uh, Mossman in northern New South Wales, and um, yeah, it was only two pages, but they weren't a big operation. They didn't have to write a lot, so and it looked really good. Um, so specify the sort of uh, how much you need, um, what security you're offering. Um, you know, make sure you state that it's first mortgage. If someone else has got a mortgage, a RAA or something like that, then you have to point that out. Um, and what what the market value is. Now, market value <clears throat> is. Um, I still find. I reckon in 80 to 90 percent of cases. Farmers are over overestimating their land value. Um, now, a lot of banks at the moment, <clears throat> um, there's only two, there's only two that do valuations in house at the moment, and even then, those those internal valuations have to be signed off by a registered valuer. Um, the other banks, the, the bulk of the banks, are requiring registered real estate valuers to conduct valuations, and um, yeah, just. Just if you can err on the side of conservatism, there's it's actually I can't ex, well I don't need to explain why, but it, it it it's not good when you over when you over um, value your property. Um, um, it, it it creates all sorts of issues further down the track because a bank might quote an interest rate, and you think, geez, that's good. I'll get um, We'll go with that one, and then the valuer goes out, and 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 it's you know, the valuation is 20 to 30 percent less. That can create um, put you into a lower risk or into a or into a higher risk category, which means the loan pricing changes, which means the bank's got to actually readjust its quote, which means all of a sudden it may not be the best deal. Um, you know, I think you should be talking to a, you know any real estate agents that you know, and I'm, I mean most farmers own know a real estate agent and just get them to give you a bit of an idea of dollars per acre or hectare um, for your country. Um, yeah, don't go too conservative either. It's it's um, you don't want to kill the deal because you've 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 undercooked it. But just talk to. Don't go off sales. <clears throat> people always because I'm involved in a lot of sales. I talk to people and they always say. So we heard such and such went for X, and I—I I mean, I might have been involved in the financing of it, and it's—I'm surprised how far off um, local communities can be um, in their understanding or their knowledge of, of certain property transactions and what properties actually did did actually sell for. So um, just be careful about quoting your own sales because bankers um, pretty much know what the real, the, the, you know, the real deal was um, um, or the, what the real uh, purchase price was, um, and 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 probably 80 or 90 percent, I think, of farmers who think they know what a price a property was sold for uh, are not right. Um, cash flow forecast. We're going to go under that in a little while. Um, um, next slide, please. Oh, okay. Security. Yep. No, go back. Sorry, Wendy. Cash flow forecast. Tax office tips. Now. This is essential. You, most of you may not have heard of this, but and it's not hard. It takes an accountant, um, well, it takes them five minutes, but it's what's called a tax office portal statement. Now, tax office debts are a statutory charge. They're like your your, your shire rates, your council rates. Um, 
um, and a statutory charge is one that ranks in front of everything, including bank loans, even you know that are mortgaged to your property. Tax office debts are highly frowned upon by the banks uh, because they are a statutory charge, and it's also an indicator that you're not. Um, it's, a, it's a management skill indicator as well. Um, if if you've got overdue money, um, now there's nothing wrong with having a GST. Uh, um, uh, debt payable that's still not payable for another two or three weeks. That's not that's not an alarm bell. But if there's a um, a, a twenty or thirty thousand dollar pay as you go tax bill that should have been paid three or four months ago, then that does raise significant alarm bells. Um, the um, yeah, so you, you're better off dealing with that early on. I've seen a lot of deals that I haven't been involved in. But I've seen deals fall over because everything looked right until um, the 11th hour when the bank asked for uh, an ATO portal statement and um, it showed a, a debt that couldn't be um, adequately covered off on or mitigated um, or explained. The other big one is bank account performance. <clears throat> um, every bank Typically what happens is if you don't address these tax office and bank account performance early, the banks don't deal with it early. They just they look at your core numbers, they give you a quote, you say, yeah, I want to go with that. The application gets lodged, it goes to credit, it gets approved, and then somewhere around there, the bank manager's running around trying to do a million other things with a million other clients, and he comes back and said, oh, look, I need those ATO, that tax office portal, and I need your last 12 months bank statements. Um, your tax office portal comes back with overdue taxes um, or your bank account performance comes back with either dishonours, which means, you know, traditionally a, a dishonour has been a check, a check that's been returned to your bank um, or your bank's actually not honoured. Um, typically these days it's a direct debit that's been rejected by your bank. Um, now, um, or it could be you going over your, your limit of your of your overdraft or, or going into debit when you should be staying in credit. So if you've been over your overdraft limit for more than 30 days um, or, or whatever the limit is for more than 30 days, you're going to have to explain why because it's, um, again, it raises a red flag. Dishonours definitely raise a red flag. One dishonour can derail a whole deal, okay, if it's not, if it's not explained properly. Now it could be. I mean, I had one again in the Central West, where a three thousand three hundred and fifty dollar repayment for a car was rejected by the bank, um, which was crazy because the clients actually had over thirty thousand dollars cash in a, in another account and and could have, you know, if the question had been asked by the bank, then the funds were there to cover it, but instead it came up as a dishonour. And um, but but the fact that we explained it to a panel of banks that were looking at the business, um, they were fine. But just you, you want to be on the front foot with these things, not on the back foot. Um, you, you, you want to be putting you want to be putting these issues to the bank, not the bank uncovering them at the eleventh hour. Oh right, thanks, Wendy. <clears throat> Historical financial performance. Um, well, actually, no, I don't have a um, workbook for that. I was going to do a workbook, but it was just going to get way too, um, not, not complicated, but it's just easier to explain it. So historical financial performance is actually just like your historical income, your sheep and your wool and your wheat, listing your wheat, except in historical financial performance, all I'm asking you to do is just put your headline numbers in a table, which is total income for each of the last three to five financial years, total expenses for each of the last three to five years, um, and what your profit or loss was for each of the three to five years. Um, and then you could actually make the bank manager's job just a bit easier by underneath that, just listing what the bank interest amount was and what depreciation was. Okay, I won't, I was going to throw a, t a table in and get you all to understand a particular formula, formula called interest cover ratio, which is extremely important in banking, but um, it's, um, um, it's uh, yeah, it just would have got a little bit complicated to do it by webinar. So um, now, how many years do you go back 
<clears throat> this is um, uh, I've seen sometimes I go back seven years, seven years unfortunately because that's how long you got to go back to find a find a good year just to show a bank because I kid you not I've had transactions in my 30 year career where a bank's gone you know we can't see where this client's ever made a dollar um, you know it's um, and and you know and you can get those sort of prolonged because banks so you understand banks have to do three years they have to do the last three years financials that's 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 under the that's regulatory that's embedded in literally in legislation and ASIC and all the other regulatory bodies that keep an eye on banks you a bank has to judge you by at least the last three years okay so um, which at the moment is 2019 2018 and 2017 as soon as we get to the first of January next year you have to have your financials done. You have to have your 2020 financials done because I can tell you now, if you all of a sudden turn up to your bank on the 15th of January next year and you want to go and buy a property or do or borrow more money or do whatever, they won't be able to give you an answer. You need to. This is a, a, a really key thing. Make sure you get your financials done by the end of the by the end of this calendar year um, because there is. There used to be a bit of a grey area, but uh, in the last few years, the banks are rock solid on um, on this first of January, and it puts a lot of pressure on on clients and a lot of pressure on accountants if we've left it too late. Okay, so um, if your numbers aren't looking too good the last few years, then be prepared to go back uh, for um, um, you know maybe five, six, seven years uh, historical. Rightio, assets. Assets, list your property, your livestock, your plant and equipment. Yeah, I'm sure most of you have done it numerous times. Cash on hand, fertiliser, hay, shares, superannuation. I get a lot of pushback from people not wanting to list their shares or superannuation. They sort of, there's this theory that says, oh, if we tell the bank we've got shares and superannuation, they're going to take it off us or try and secure it. Um, it's just not. That's not correct. It's it's actually it's actually an advantage to your case to tell the banks what you've got in cash or shares or superannuation. The banks don't they don't want it. They don't want to take it as security. But if they see that you have other assets that are highly liquid, i.e., shares can be sold and paid for within three days. Superannuation, well, you can get access to in financials certain certain financial circumstances. Um, you know, put that. That's the first thing you want to, you know, you want to get down on there is showing a bank that you have assets that, if things get tough, you can call on those assets, and you're not a hundred, a hundred percent agriculture. Um, don't hide that stuff. Um, they'll find out anyway, one way or another, that you've got it. Uh, like I said, make sure everything's as close to market value as you can. Don't argue. Them. I've seen families spend ages arguing amongst themselves what sheep are worth and you know what the cows are worth just um, yeah just just you all know what the market's doing so just work on current market uh, prices uh, liabilities list everything um, you know obviously farm loans um, your credit cards what your limit your balance is personal loans creditors RAA R uh, RIC loans all that stuff's got to go in um, and then your equity so equity Equity's always been an important number. It's really simple to work out. It's basically just, you know, what what percentage of all your assets do you own, um, less less your liabilities. So if you've got a million dollars worth of assets and two hundred thousand dollars worth of debt, it means you've got eighty percent equity. Equity's still really important. It's the, it's, it's the simplest thing to work out, but it it actually tells a bank how many gives an idea. Of how long, how many bad years you can have. So if you you really want to be above 60%, that's got to be your target. Um, pretty much your long-term goal is to have at least 60% equity, uh, which means that of the million dollars, you you know there's there's um, there's four hundred thousand dollars of debt, and um, which is 60% equity. You can go under 60% equity for a land acquisition, but you know just um, a, Banks won't go much under 50%, um, and if you're down around that sub 60 after a land acquisition, 
there will be, you know, there'll be some expectations that you get it back up over 60, 65%. And obviously, the stronger you are, the the better you are for the next acquisition or an off-farm investment or or to get through the next drought. Um, where are we up to? Next slide, please, Wendy. Just talk about your management skills. <clears throat> you know, did you go to uni? If you did, what course did you do? Um, what did you do before you, you became involved in agriculture? You know, did you work in the trading floor in Sydney and, and you know, or Jackaroo up in the Territory or down in the Riverina? Um, we both know that with this sample credit paper that that, that Mary's a nurse, so um, yeah, put that down. Um, but there's nothing wrong with saying you've had a life a lifetime experience on the land. Um, a lot of my credit papers pretty much say that. You know, um, Mark's had a, a lifetime experience on the land, um, and you know, but it's just. Uh, but if if there's anything else you can add, you know, Ag College, um, Hawks, Orange Ag, or something. Um, Great. Second way out. Uh, this is this has pretty much been the standard since the early 90s. Um, you have to basically re you have to basically tell a lender that if you can't repay a debt by cash flow, then you're prepared to sell something to get out of trouble. And in this particular case, they're buying Clifton, which is the purchase property. Um, you just have to basically say that you know if things don't work out you'll sell it if you infer either in writing or face to face with a bank <clears throat> that once you've got an asset it doesn't matter what happens you're never going to let it go then i reckon you won't get the loan it's 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 a it's part of banking dna now that we have what's called a second way out that we have what's called a willingness to repay debt and and you know um, I don't know how old you all are, but I'm sure there's a fair range. If any of you, I was, I, I started my banking career in the early 90s when things just went totally pear-shaped and interest rates were at 20%. And it's pretty much in, in banking DNA that um, unless you're prepared to um, relinquish assets in the event that things can't, you can't, you know, you can't do it by cash flow, then you will not get the finance in the first place. Okay. You say you're a fifth generation farmer and no uh, bugger it, I'm not bloody selling anything and you know um, the bank can go and get nicked if if things get tough. I just you just won't you won't get any you won't get anywhere. You'll just you just you you have to be prepared to um, and you have to acknowledge the bank that you are prepared to pay pay debt out. Our personal personal risk insurance. Um, <clears throat> it's always one that's generally missed, but it's you know it's a bit like shares and superannuation. If a bank knows that you know, there's two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of life insurance and one hundred and fifty grand of trauma, as in this case study's example. Then it takes a lot of pressure off the bank, knowing that if something happened to Mark or to Mary, that the the, the remaining um, partner um, has something to um, to fall back on uh, while they're trying to work, you know, out the estate and and all the issues that come with it. Um, I can speak firsthand with some clients, again, in New South Wales who have just been through this. Unfortunately, um, uh, the wife lost uh, her, her fight against breast cancer. Um, and just knowing that there was some personal risk insurance in place has just, it's just made life so much easier for, for the husband and for the bank and the bank manager that's, um, you know, supporting the family. So if you don't have personal risk insurance, um, certainly look into it. It doesn't have to be a lot, but it, it's 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 important you do it for yourselves um, and not just for the bank. But it is, you know, banks do look favourably on it in their in their risk assessment because everything that I'm telling you is about reducing your your risk. Rightio. So, and the conclusion just has to be simple. Um, uh, you know, the example I've given you is quite often some about as much as we write sometimes. This is a well secured property backed by sound equity off farm income, a strong work ethic and a willingness to repay debt. Um, I'm just going to finish because I know I'm going about to go over time or actually am over time. We're going to work on cash flows. Um, you've got a cash flow there. <clears throat> now the one you've got actually unfortunately would print up on five pages so I've already broken the, the first rule there. Um, I've sent Wendy another version. It's really important that you try and get a cash flow onto one page, okay? Um, if, if a manager's got to print up six pages and then sticky tape it together, it's um, that's not good. Um, 
very rarely that I need to go on any more than one page. Generally, if I do, it's going down one page so that you, your income and expenses go from go vertically down, but never never have it so it prints out, you know, two across and four down or something like that. Um, you'll notice in this cash flow that I don't have any zeros. There's no there's no income or expense there where there's not a um, a number. Um, and one of the one of the if you had an expense item in there and no number, then all you're going to do is get a question back from the bank. Well, why? Why is there a reason why you haven't put something in there? And you might say, well, <clears throat> you know, uh, I don't need to put dog 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 food in there because we don't actually have any dogs. But you know, it it, it can be, you know, <clears throat> if you've grabbed a cash flow, if you're a grazier and you've grabbed a cash flow Excel spreadsheet off off a mate who's a who's a, a cropping guy. Um, there's going to be a whole lot of lines like chemical and and stuff that you're not going to need. Um, just you do ha just delete it because you, all you're going to do is get questions asked as to why those boxes aren't filled and for no other, no other reason than they're irrelevant. But credit managers don't know that, so um, yeah, take that out. Um, I see a lot of cash flows where there's no running balance. Basically, the cash flow finishes at that third line from the bottom. So if you can see profit and loss. That's where a lot of back, that's where a lot of clients' cash flows finish. Um, they're actually not the most important bit is that absolute bottom line, which is the the closing overdraft balance. That's telling a bank where your maximum debt is um, is forecast to be, and that therefore tells the bank uh, what sort of overdraft they might need to give you. Um, and um, so yeah, so no, it's it's make sure you've got that running closing balance and. <clears throat> I mean, I've massaged this cash flow, but it shows that they're running it, you know, um, in debit up until the end of December, and then we get our crop income come in, and they go into credit. Banks love seeing overdraft facilities or lines of credit going go into credit at least once a year. That's a you can sort of score some pretty good um, um, uh, points on a risk profile for that. Doesn't always happen, but um, yeah, and just just. You'll see the rationale. You'll see an income. I've given, I've, I've told the bank how I've arrived at that wheat income. Now, quite often, farm people will actually have a separate worksheet, and that's fine. But again, we're trying to save time here. So just um, if you can fit that into a cash flow, which I've had 3,000 acres at 0.8 ton to the acre at $275 a ton. Bang! It's all done. It's all there. The bank manager is not looking for other sheets in the background. Um, yeah, and that's about it. I think, have I got another slide? Oh, yep, 20 minutes. Um, if anyone ever wants to talk about anything, just um, give me a call. Uh, 20 minutes, I can usually work out all sorts of things um, in 20 minutes. If required, we can get face to face um, for a couple of hours sometime. Um, when, I, uh, when I'm out your way, I do travel a fair bit and um, the only condition is that if I come out on farm I get a cup of tea and that's that's about it but look thanks for your time I'm sorry I've gone over time a tad um, we can move pretty much into Q&A if you like Wendy I'll let you drive that and um, yeah hopefully you've all got something out of it thanks thanks Brad uh, that was a really informative presentation and a lot of detail there for our, um, our our participants today so as as we head towards this question and answer session um, if there's any further questions that our participants would like to um, put into the text box at the moment now's your time to do so so while we're while we're just setting that up um, I'd also just like to bring to your attention for anybody that are is joining us today. At the end of this webinar, there will actually be a quick two-minute feedback survey, and that feedback is uh, feedback both to Brad, myself, and also to the rest of the Central West Ag team about your thoughts on today's webinar, the topic, or any other future webinar topics or uh, events that you would like to see covered. So those those feedback comments are really um, really important in shaping some of our direction and certainly that's how this second webinar came about because of the feedback from the first webinar from our uh, our participants and producers that joined us on that one so that'll just 
groups launch automatically straight after after this webinar for those participants. If you do have to duck off or if you are listening to this as a recording, there is that opportunity as well that uh, that feedback component will also be linked to this recording as well. So um, if you do need to go, that will be received with the recording um, about one o'clock tomorrow, about 24 hours after this event today. So. Um, really appreciate anybody that takes the time to do that feedback. So we'll move into question time right now. So Brad, I'll just, um, I'll kick off with the first question for you. We've got a question sent in by Lucy. Lucy asked, as a next gen, how would she go about approaching a bank to borrow money um, to buy out her parents in that sort of intergenerational succession changeover? Uh, yeah, thanks, Lucy. Uh, the Oh, geez. I have given a talk specifically about this. Um, uh, if you're, it depends on your financial resources. So if you're well resourced yourself um, and you're confident you can um, do it all yourself, then that becomes a, a, a pretty much a standalone transaction for you. But typically, um, you know, if you're next generation, you don't have a lot behind you and you would need to actually have two deals um, effectively, one with your parents um, where they maybe leave some equity in uh, because a bank will only lend up to say 60 or 70 percent absolute max um, against land value. So if you're looking to buy out some country, um, I've always said that typically you've got to come up with about 35 to 40 percent because you, you do you might have to pay stamp duty unless it's intergenerational. So quite often you end up talk, having two bankers, one banker being um, your parents who um, might leave some money in and the other one being your a, a commercial bank so you it's best that you do a deal with your parents first and say to them well look you know I can pay you 10% um, cash of what I want to buy from you um, would you be prepared to leave say 30% in and um, organize that on commercial terms and in my young farmer presentations around New South Wales I cover off on this topic in some detail so make sure you get one to one of those and then once you've got your 10% mum and dad's 30% which is 40% then you can go down and sit down with a bank with a proposition um, um, presented just the way I've explained to you then and uh, um, and see if the bank will come up with the other 30 to 35% so yeah that's um, a bit, bit of a hard one to answer in a short short space. Great, thanks Brad. Um, right, I might bring Nerily in at the moment. Nerily, have you got a question there that um, from one of our audience that we can um, yeah go forward with? Yeah, there's probably one here Wendy that ties in quite nicely. Um, we've had one question, if you're purchasing an initial piece of land in conjunction with your parents, would you recommend starting the succession planning with the whole family at that stage alongside the finance discussions with your bank? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, potentially, uh, you could. Um, not, but not necessarily. I think, uh, um, you know, again, it comes down to whether the family's ready to get into, you know, ready to address succession planning or not. Um, maybe, maybe the, there's already, if there's already been discussion around it, by all means, use the property purchase as a catalyst for having that, uh, that, that broader succession planning discussion. Just be aware, though, that the only thing I'm concerned about is you're, you're starting to open up two fairly major transactions or projects. So one, you're trying to secure a property purchase, which in itself can burn up a lot of time and energy. And then if all of a sudden you, you sort of try and create a succession planning um, <clears throat> um, project on top of that, you, yeah, you could be, I yeah, I probably, I'm not sure I'd do that <clears throat> um, because the, the succession planning thing's actually going to take a lot longer than what the property transaction is going to take. If the property's coming up for auction in four or five weeks, you just got to get in and get that organised. Um, if you try to throw a succession planning talk in there, I've never seen one get a succession plan get um, sorted out within five to six weeks. So I'd, I'd, I'd probably, <clears throat> um, I think you would only go into a property purchase 
with your parents if 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 there was a reasonable understanding of how succession planning was going to fall, um, unfold in the future anyway. So um, and 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 I doubt you know parents have always whether they say it or not they've always got succession planning in the back of their mind. But um, for a property acquisition, I think you just need to to focus on the on that actual transaction and 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 deal with the succession planning um, later. Thanks. Mm. Great, thanks for that, Brad. Um, there's another good question that's come in. How do we measure business health and viability? Um, how can we ensure that that business survives for the next generation? Uh, well, some of those key parameters I touched on before, so preferably at least 65% equity. So, you know, if you've got a million dollars worth of assets, there's only $350,000 worth of debt. Um, the other 65% being your equity. Um, that's a good indicator um, of, of being in a reasonably sound position. I mean, the higher it is, the, the more flexibility it gives you to do things um, like off-farm investments for, for some of the other kids that may not be coming back. Um, uh, just, uh, you know, looking after your assets. Um, bankers, you know, and this is... Whenever I drive onto a property, because I was a bank manager for 20 years, you, you do tend to start judging. You, you start judging an operation right from day one, from driving on and looking how a property, whether it's well maintained or not. So you know, just just looking after your equity, um, maintaining good relationships with your lenders, um, um, maintaining your your equity levels. Uh, I mean, you know, obviously trying to run profitably. Um, that's all part of you know, positioning yourself um, as, a, as, a, as a reasonably strong business that, that, that's got, you know, the capacity to have discussions with banks um, in the future. Uh, profitability is pretty important. It's been lacking a bit in the last uh, three or four years, but, um, but, but even, even with that, that poor, those poor income levels over the last three years, the banks, I think the banks are as keen to get back into lending as people are for borrowing because it's there's not been, you know, the banks have been sitting on their portfolios with not a lot of growth and um, banks make money out of lending money. So, yeah, they're really scrutinising transactions at the moment. But if you're in a reasonably, you know, a sound to good position, then, uh, yeah, those opportunities will come around. Yeah, Thanks, great. Ellen. Uh, and Brad, and the next question coming in is, do banks look at farm management deposits favourably or would they rather see the money spent on farm? Uh, yeah, no, they're pretty, they're looked on pretty favourably. I mean, showing the capacity to save or put aside cash and, you know, obviously it's got tax advantages as, as well. Um, if you use the farm management deposit, I mean, if, if the farm needs investment, then by all means invest in the farm, but um, but but cash is a far more tangible sort of asset that that and 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 it is it is highly ranked as a form of um, of financial management to have um, cash on hand. In fact, a bank manager said to me yesterday that um, from one of the major banks that um, having you know just been able to contribute. Any amount of cash to a maybe a property purchase is 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 favourably you know is 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 seen favourably by the banks because um, at the moment you can imagine a lot of farmers are, don't have a lot of cash but property transaction um, activity has increased which means there's and I'm aware that there are some transactions where we're talking 100% finance so um, and and and. The manager that's involved in that transaction said, "You know, it'd just be so much easier if there was a bit of cash to to go into the transaction." So, yeah, no, look, hang on to that FMD. Um, just don't throw cash at your farm unless you really need to. I'm I'm, I'm not a big fan of overcapitalising farms or even taking them to 100% capacity because I've always seen that that last 10, you know, that last 10% of investment. In, in productivity comes at a very high cost. So it's when clients' properties get up to 85 to 90 percent capacity that I um, I become a big fan of uh, um, you know maybe another property another property purchase. Um, 
but um, yeah, no, FMDs are great. Um, hang on to that if you can, um, and 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 the account advisors that you, you, you do that. Thank you. Yeah, great. Um, there's been another question come in, and Brad, I'm not sure if you're able to see the question in the panel because it's got a bit of detail to it. It might be easier for you to answer. Um, right. So there's someone's having trouble convincing um, their parents to talk about succession. Yeah. Um, they personally have some cash involved and some shares. They're in their mid thirties. What's the best way for them to go about asking the bank for money? Can they to purchase a portion of the parents' place? Um, and the parents don't want to talk about it. Is that what it's inferring, or I can't see? Yeah, that's, right. that's the case. They're not really. Ah, oh, sorry yeah. about that. So they're having um, trouble convincing the parents to have that succession planning discussion. Yeah. So right. they've got some money in cash and some shares. Um, they've got some cattle themselves. Would they be in a position um, to go and ask the bank themselves to purchase a portion of the, the place? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Potentially, if they if they can't have the discussion with mum and dad, maybe just start with the bank and say to the bank what would what would um, you know? To what extent could the bank support a transaction? And then there's going to be a shortfall. There's no doubting that. Um, once you're aware of what the shortfall is, then you put a deal. You know, you basically sit down with your parents. So it's one of the part of the talk I give with young farmers is about how to sort of approach this. And quite honestly. The key to is that it has to be on commercial terms. I mean, I just, um, you know, to walk in and have an expectation that your parents are going to cough up cash or or, or, or equity um, without any sort of commercial terms wrapped around that is is just generally doesn't work. So find out from the bank what a bank would be prepared to to lend to. Um, a bank might only want to go to 50 or 60 percent max. Um, doesn't matter what it is. Once you know where the shortfall is between your cash, you sit down with your parents and say, "Look, you know, I'd like to buy the family farm or part of it. Um, I'm three hundred thousand dollars short. I'd like um, the bank will give me sixty percent. Um, I've got ten percent. I need you. I would like you to leave thirty percent in. I'm going to pay you interest on that thirty percent, similar to what um, I'd pay for a bank, and I'm going to." Um, Repay it over 15 years, so it's 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 on commercial terms. You're actually doing you, you're actually treating your parents um, as if they are a bank as well. Um, anything less, and you, if if you don't do that, you increase the probability of the parents saying, "Well, no, not interested." Um, but if you put commercial terms to them, then generally they still might say no, but they might say, "Well, yep, that's a great idea. We'll accept it," um, and they might even say, "Well, that's a great idea," but don't you don't have to pay us four percent interest you only need to pay us two percent or you know we'll give you 20 years or whatever to pay it out over but always start the transaction off on commercial terms but yeah look if you can't sit down with them at the start work out what you can do with the bank and then and then and then talk to mum and dad about you know the, the the piece that you know that you definitely need to talk to them about thanks Thanks, Brad. Um, so we've got a hand raised by Stephen. Stephen, I've just unmuted you. Can you hear us? Just not sure if his internet capabilities at the moment. Uh, we've been asking. Yeah, hi, hi, Stephen. Um, you yeah, right, I'll give you my email. Ask your Brad. question. Um, so, Stephen. Yep. Yeah, uh, he seems to have um, seems to have dropped out there. So, Stephen, if you um, like to maybe type your question in there, I know you've had your hand raised a little bit. I just seem to be um, seeing that your internet connection's not strong enough at the moment for an audio. Um, so, Brad, the next type of question um, coming through is, what would you consider is a healthy equity level? Oh. Uh, yeah, look, that 65% plus, Wendy. Um, as I yeah, as I've indicated a couple of times, I think 
uh, that's that's where the banks are looking for. Um, that's that's the starting point for any any assessment, be it property purchase, renegotiating your interest rates, succession plan. Um, it's that preferably to be 65% plus, or you know, or really 60% minimum. Um, and and to drop below 60% would be acceptable in a property acquisition where you might you might actually be start at 75 80% and drop down to 55 because of the acquisition but um, at least the bank knows that you know that you, you that you've been at in the in the right space before and and that um, you're going to be sort of trying to get back there as soon as you can so yeah look 65% is pretty much a starting point thanks Righto, thanks for that. Yeah, it's good to know that that's the level right across the board, not just particularly for um, for you know, alignment of, of finances, of investing and that sort of side of things. Um, Brad, in terms of uh, another question we've got there, how would you say, um, you know, people should be going about balancing paying off debt and then looking to reinvest into, into the business? Is there a better strategy or way you'd recommend going about it? Um, yeah, look in agriculture, there's always something to spend money on. That's the that's the you know look. I've I've had some of my clients. I've had oh geez, 15 years now, and um, and everybody's different. I mean, you know, I've got clients that just as soon as they get a even a, a a whiff of um, that a bank might lend them more money to buy more country, they'll they'll jump onto it, um, and um, and they'll just keep going. Others um, are, are, are happier just to have what they've got and 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 work away at reducing debt and making sure sure their property is well maintained and 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 as productive as it can be within an, an efficient um, level. So there is no rhyme or reason to um, to um, to paying down debt and 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 then reinvesting. It's there's so many variables in there. It's you know are you having to cater for um, three or four children of which one or two are coming back on the land and two aren't. So you know it might be not so much reinvesting in ag but investing outside of ag into into assets that ultimately might um, solve the, the the succession planning issues in the future. Um, yeah, so look, sorry, no, no clear formula there. It's that's that might be one of those twenty-minute. Give me a call and have a chat for twenty minutes. Um, one-on-one -on -one job, actually. Thanks. Any other questions? Good. Oh, I'm just having a look through um, the list. I think you've um, quite extensively covered on most things. Um, there's one that probably hasn't been answered. Somebody's asking, do you have a feeling for what some of the best accounting software might be for farm businesses? To make it easier oh, for them to bring their information together and present to the bank. Yeah, good question. Um, only because I'm, <laughs> I've got to pick a package. My wife is a professional bookkeeper, so it's, um, yeah, we sort of talk about it all the time. I've actually become a little bit of a fan of Zero just recently. Um, I'm involved in a couple of other different businesses, and um, yeah, Zero. And in fact, one of my family um, entities, yeah, we're just looking at bringing that over to Zero as well. But I've always traditionally been a fan of QuickBooks. Um, Myob, Myob is good if you're a real you're a real sort of I shouldn't say it but a bit of a, a bit of a nerd for figures and reconciliation and 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 all that sort of stuff um, but I find my ob is a little bit harder to undo um, transactions it, it tends to audit everything you do um, whereas QuickBooks is a you know a bit more user friendly and zero is really sort of appearing to be taking the the business community by storm. Um, it's it's you know I've just been using it this morning. It's I actually I actually really like it. It's probably one of the most user friendly bookkeeping systems I've used, and it can actually really easily link into your bank account and just 
suck the transactions out of you out of your bank account um, on a on a daily basis and and bring that into an accounting type format. So yeah, it's um, I'm not not on any commission with zero or anything, but um, and I've dealt with Phoenix and Myob and QuickBooks, but yeah, I'd, I'd I'd certainly just do a bit of a Google search and 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 check out Zero QuickBooks and um, and if you've got Phoenix, Phoenix is still great. So there's nothing wrong with Phoenix. My ob I've always struggled with because I uh, I uh, it's 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 I think it's more for professionals, professional bookkeepers and 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 accountants. But and and the other thing you need to know is um, I think Zero is becoming a big winner with accountancy firms. So my wife and I were just talking the other day about the fact that zero is probably going to save us some accounting bills um, um, by just you know because that data will feed straight through to the accounting the accountants um, software as well so yeah anyway something you think about thanks thanks Brad, yeah, thanks um, that, that was Brad. great um, it is something sorry Randy, yeah sorry Neroli um I think um, I think that's probably about as much time as we've can uh, stretch out the question and answer time for and particularly um, getting your thoughts there on that accountancy programs and software is uh, I think it's a common question that we all all grapple with about what's the best um, best to use and sort of what's what's out there in the uh, realm of different programs so thanks for your thoughts on that um, so as I said yeah that's about as much as I can stretch the timer out for question time so um, if anybody would um, like to get in contact with Brad his details are currently listed on your screen now and also if anybody needs to um, contact myself in terms of the um, following up from today's webinar or a component of the webinar you can also certainly contact me as well so that brings us to the end of um, today's session and I'd really like to thank all the participants who have logged on today live um, to go through the different content that we've presented and also the discussion points in that question and answer session so we hope that that's been really valuable for your businesses again uh, I'd like to thank Brad Sewell for his time today and his um, his efforts in in his presentation to really go through the different components of the detail to ensure that you know we're all all pitching and, and basing and having a really constructive conversation with our banks and also uh, if with our business components of our business to ensure that whether it's for family or, or for other purposes we're actually making sure we're across the information that we need to have as well for that to be productive. I'd also like to thank Nerilee Brennan for her assistance in co-facilitating and running that question an answer session I think that having that additional time has really paid off in ensuring that we've um, definitely covered a very diverse range of question types from all uh, all sections of the audience today so thank you very much to you both I look forward to hosting and engaging uh, with all of our audience today in future Central West local land services events so until next time I will you are uh, having a great day and make sure um, you all stay safe. See you next time and thank you very much.